Some time ago I played several games in the Napoleonics 20 system by Victory Point Games. That's a system that I really enjoyed and I'm not even uh, that much of a Napoleonic player really. But those games are very simple, very linear, playable in one session. Sometimes you can play several games in a single session. Uh, very simple, easy to teach, yet at the same time challenging, fun, a lot of interesting tactical decisions and also uh, quite a good amount of historical flavor and detail. Definitely enjoyed that. So since I enjoyed uh, those designs so much, as you can imagine, I was pretty excited when I heard that GMT was going to republish some of those games and to add new games in the GMT format with the GMT quality of components, best of both worlds. And now finally, this uh, hybrid of the best of both the worlds has come out and it is called Fading Glory. This is the first volume, I, I hope it is the first volume, meaning I hope that there are more in the future. This is the first of a sequence. Fitting Glory reprints some of the battles that had been introduced in the Napoleon X20 system before and also there are new uh, battles here, new scenarios. This is a quadri-pack for scenarios for battles and actually some of those battles can be played uh, in different ways. There are variants that are available to test different possibilities. So actually uh, there's a lot of replay value in here. Uh, this, uh, at, at the price of anticipating my conclusions, I can tell you that I thought I was going to love this and there were no surprises there. I definitely enjoyed this game very much. In my video today I'm going to show you the scenarios that you can find in this pack here, in this quadri pack. I'm not going to uh, describe the Napoleon 20 system again because I did that in one of my old videos. You can watch that video, I'm going to link it to this video somewhere, in, well, look at the bottom, at the bottom of the screen, you should, you should find the link there. Um, you can watch that video if you do not know the Napoleon X20 system. Today I'm going to tell about Fitting Glory only. Here you see the map and the setup for the Bordino scenario. The Russian units start on the board, ready to defend against the French advance. Uh, some of the units that belong to the Russian army start the game uh, inactive and to represent that I place them face down. Uh, units that start inactive represent Kutuzov's hesitation, his initial unwillingness to commit too many troops to the action because he believed that the majority of the French attack would come from this direction. Actually, he was wrong, that didn't happen and that is not going to happen in this game because the main attack is going to come from this direction. Still, to represent his hesitation, uh, in order to activate these units so that they can move and fight freely, you need to roll a die on this table each turn and you may be able to activate a unit per turn. There are modifiers based on the position of the French units on the board, the more they advance, the more Kutuzov starts figuring it out and the more willing he is to, to uh, correct the situation uh, and in fact later in the game after the French units pass this line here, this orange line here, the, um, the uh, Russian player may be able to activate up to two units per turn and of course inactive units will become active if they are attacked by the French player. The French player doesn't start with any unit on the board. All of the French units available in this game enter the game as reinforcements starting from turn 1 until turn 7. Napoleon enters the game only in turn 4. And the uh, French player will mainly enter from this area, so probably the French player will want to mount a powerful attack in this area to create a strong line here. Also because the French player needs to take control of that objective hex as soon as possible. That is a French objective hex that the French player is trying to defend against the Russian player. Otherwise the French player will lose victory points and, uh, well, morale points, but in this game actually if you lose morale points then you lose the game. So. I still not victory points, I don't know what I said there. In any case, a uh, powerful French attack in this area seems to be a good idea also because the French player is trying to advance in this area here and to reach 
these two objective hexes, which are objective hexes that the Russian player is trying to defend to protect his own morale points. Um, of course, uh, there will be some units coming from here, but not many, and these units can create a minor nuisance for the friend for the Russian player maybe a diversionary attack in any case um, there is a possibility yes of working on both sides of the river so a lot of different options a lot of historical flavor capture in just a very simple very minimalist design which of course is one of the things that I like the most in the uh, Napoleonic's 20 system Map and setup for the Smolensk scenario. Not many units start on the board, there are only three Russian units on the board and two French units and a leader. Most of the units in the game will enter the board, the French player from here and the Russian player from up there. And there will be some action. Well, there's, there's going to be a possible action in several locations on the map. Very important feature on the map is this river here that is not very easy to cross. There is a bridge here, yes, but it is in the middle of the city of Smolensk, which is a city that may... Uh, get ablaze, there is an event that would get the city ablaze, then when that happens the entire cluster that forms the city counts as rugged terrain for movement purposes, that means that you can move only one X as soon as you enter an X when, where there is the fire that counts as on fire, then you have to stop. So actually the city may become pretty problematic to move through. Well, it just will, it will just take longer. The French player has the uh, option to build pontoons here, but it takes a unit out of its movement allowance for a turn to cross the river and build the pontoon. Also, there is an undiscovered ford on the map right there. Yes, it is printed on the map, but you have to pretend as a French player that you do not know about it. But if you have a unit on one of the two axes that are connected by the ford, you really die only five or six, you discover the ford. The Russians know where the ford is, they can use it at any time, but if they do that, then they give away the location of the ford, and from that moment on, the French player counts as having discovered it. No objective hexes that the French player needs to protect, on the contrary, the Russian player needs to rush to the defense of that objective hex and that objective hex. Uh, well, let's see how this goes. I haven't played it yet, so I'm gonna play it next. I'm gonna rectify that, trust me. But later on today, I don't know that I will have a chance to film a segment, so I wanted to uh, give you an introduction to this scenario now that I can film. Usually in my videos I show you the setup of the games that I'm playing, but not in this case. Here you have the board for the Battle of Salamanca, Salamanca scenario, but this is not the setup of the game. Because at the beginning of the game, all units start on the turn track, all the units enter the game as reinforcements, there are no units on the board, so there wasn't really much to show you. And what you see here is the end of turn 3, uh, when the units have already entered the board, or at least many or most of the units have entered the board. British units enter from that area there, and French units from here. Here you have a British objective hex, there's also one in Salamanca, and here you have a French objective hex. Uh, so because of the location of entry areas and objective hexes, the two armies will probably tend to march in columns so using the roads to reach uh, their objectives so that they can defend their objective X and then from there they can attack the objective X of the opponent. This simulates the fact that historically the two armies at this point had been marching parallel to one another for several days uh, with the two commanders being unwilling to commit to battle. Actually to simulate this there's a special rule here that says that the first time that a player enters an enemy zone of control that player loses a morale point. After that the battle has started and there are no penalties for entering zones of control things work normally, but that means that there will be a burden on the first player that starts an engagement with the enemy. 
other special rules say that in this battle minor reavers count as shallow streams so they have no effect on combat even though they retain their usual effects on movement and retreats and also in this situation the French morale is pretty low uh, it is harder for the French player to rally than it usually is uh, and in this scenario the French player has a penalty of minus one for each unit that he tries to rally which is a pretty steep penalty I think that is really going to affect things other than that than these uh, there aren't many other uh, special rules here couple of optional rules I'm using one of them which is to use a special possible reinforcement for the French that reinforcement is placed on the turn track um, on turn six and you start the running on turn six to see uh, whether or not that unit enters the game and because of this there's a penalty of minus one to French morale if you decide to use that optional rule but pretty much this is a linear standard scenario um, with a lot of opportunities in this uh, game that I'm playing here and experimenting with having the two armies reach the area uh, where their objective axes are and then trying to fight it out there later I want to try the scenario again and to see what happens if the armies engage earlier and then what happens if one of the armies diverts part of its forces to try to attack the rear of the opponent I think that's really because of the fact that the units entered the board um, at the beginning of the game there isn't a situation that is already set up on the board this is a scenario that will have a lot of replay value and a lot of things that one can experiment with from game to game and here you have the map for the Waterloo scenario very nice looking map and I'm showing it to you so you can get a sense of what it looks like and just of the quality of the components that you find in Fading Glory but I'm not going to tell you about the scenario per se about gameplay because I already discussed Waterloo in the video that I filmed some time ago uh, when the Waterloo game was released as an independent game by Victory Point Games in introduction, I already talked about the virtues of the Napoleonic Twenty system, the reasons why I like it so much, and I said that there were no surprises for me in playing this game, which is great when one's expectations are as high as mine were. The game met and exceeded expectations. This is really a great package. I enjoyed it. All the battles, uh, they play in different ways, some more, some enjoy, some enjoy a little bit more, some enjoy a little bit less, uh, but definitely all good work gaming. I would say that probably enjoy small and more than, than the other ones, that's probably my favorite one. I like the bifocal nature of the conflict, I like how you have to commit your units to one of the two main areas of fighting and you have to do that. Uh, in advance because it takes a while before the units that are entering the board can reach relevant areas. Uh, there is an area of the board that is sealed off by a river and the French player has to figure out how to cross it and where the best places to do that are and the allies, the allied player of course has to react to that. A lot of interesting things going on here. In any case, I find this to be a great package with a lot of replay value. Some of the scenarios that I told you about and this video can be played uh, accordingly, uh, according to different variants, which increase the replay value even more. Components are beautiful, absolutely outstanding, best of both worlds, really. So, uh, if you've never tried the Napoleonic 20 system before, I think that this is the place to start. With one investment, you get a beautiful game, you get a lot of different um, combat situations that you can play with the things that you find in this box. Great intro to the system and great uh, replay value here. If you already know the system and even if you already have played some of the battles that come in this box, you will probably want to uh, consider uh, Fading Glory quite seriously because the upgrade is, is just so good that, well, if you enjoyed the system before, you probably will want to have uh, your games in that system uh, redone with such, um, such a higher quality of components. 
we need box, which is great, so that you know where your boxes and where your games are on the shelf. That makes a uh, organizing your collection much easier than uh, with the Ziplo bags in which Victory Point games used to come. In any case, very, very, very good product. I enjoyed the, the, the Victory Point incarnation of the of the Napoleonix 20 system and I'm definitely enthusiastic about the GMT rebirth of that system.